As it was mentioned, you can turn with me to 1 Peter. It is a joy. Uh, it was a joy for me to work through this as I work through this first sermon. Second sermon's done, and the third sermon is on the way. So it, it's been a, a, a great blessing for me, and I pray that it would be a great blessing for you too. Um, could I ask you to switch this light off, if it's possible? It's just with my bald patch. Okay. <laughs> Good. Well, First Peter, we're going to look at the first two verses. As I said, here we go. Now, I've been a little bit of a, well, a little bit of background of myself. I've been to 42 countries in my lifetime. I lived in five of those as a foreigner uh, in those countries. And in those countries, different people have different greetings. So some said, how's it? Some said, hello. Some said, namaste. And some said, sawadika. Those are the four countries of the five that I lived in. And those were all different greetings. Now, added to this, recently I've told some of you that I, uh, I'm not enjoying life on earth at the moment. I've got this serious desire to be in heaven. I don't know, am I in the right place? Who am I? Now, before you get concerned about my mental state, I'm all okay. But I think I suffer what Peter is talking about in 1 Peter. Talking about this seriousness of life on earth and this desire to be with the Lord because of all the suffering and trials that we are experiencing. Now, Peter starts with this uh, two-verse greeting. And it's, it's a strange greeting because you don't really think of it as a greeting. But there's a good reason for it. It's packed with theology. It's packed with theology. And that's why I'm going to take, hopefully, 45 minutes to expound two verses. Because there are lots of things that we need to look at from this text. Now, from the front, on, on the front end, the purpose of this letter is hope. Hope and encouragement. It gives hope to, be, to the believer in their confession of Jesus while they're enduring suffering and trials. It encourages the believer to live godly lives, bringing glory to God and showing the, the, the world around them who he is. Peter is writing to help believers understand how to maintain the glory of God, their profession of faith, as they are being bruised by sin in the world. And I pray for us as a church, as we go through 1 Peter, that we would have the same experience. Over the 13 years that I've been in this church, I've experienced a lot of suffering. And it's been good for my soul. So let's read verse 1 to 2. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's just the modern day Greek, uh, Turkey, sorry. Which, by the way, they've changed their name again. Sorry. Verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sp sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, this morning I'd like to discuss these two verses under three reminders. And the first reminder is from verse 1, remember who you are. Now, the book starts with Peter, the first word in the first verse, Peter. So, who was Peter? Peter was one of the first disciples Jesus called. He was the one that walked on water. Peter was the one that confessed Jesus as Lord. And then Jesus said, Peter, on you, on your confession, I will build my church. Peter was the one disciple that rebuked Jesus saying, no, Jesus, you're not going to die. Praise the Lord, he did. Peter was one of the disciples that saw Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Man, what a privilege. Peter left everything behind 
to follow Jesus. Peter was the one that went ahead and prepared the Passover meal. Being one of Jesus' closest disciples, his friends, Peter was one of the guys that, that stayed with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with him. And he fell asleep. Peter was also the one that denied Jesus three times. But the same Peter was restored by Jesus. Peter made promises that he could not keep. Lord, I would not deny you. And he broke those promises. Now as I work through this, looking into Peter, who Peter was, I couldn't help but think, why do we not have a gospel of Peter? Like we do with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, Peter, the disciple, the friend, the faithful person that walked along Jesus, he did not write the gospel. But he did write 1 Peter. He was a humble guy. He says, I am Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter knew who he was. He was a mere man, even though he went through all these experiences with the great Lord Jesus Christ. He's a mere man, humble, saying, I'm a messenger of Jesus. All of those things, all these wonderful things that can earn me medals, that's nothing. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm a messenger. And without Jesus, I am nothing. And that is enough for Peter. I am of Jesus Christ. Now, he also mentions he's an apostle. Okay? He mentions that he's an apostle. So an apostle is a, a person that was appointed by Jesus to spread the word of Jesus. He's writing this letter saying, I'm an apostle. So whoever hears this letter being read or whoever reads this letter, remember I speak on behalf of God. I'm an apostle. This letter carries authority. Now, just a, a side note here, uh, a lot of recent days, a lot of people say, I'm, a, I'm an apostle, right? Have you, have you read about that? Like, I'm the authority, you need to follow me, unlike Paul says, as I follow Christ. They just say, follow me, but those are all false apostles, just for the mere fact of an apostle had to be an eyewitness of Jesus. I haven't seen Jesus, neither have they, and we read that in Acts 1 and John 15, Apostles also had to be chosen by Jesus himself, Luke 6 and John 14. Trained by Jesus, Luke 6, and able to perform miracles, real miracles, Acts 2 and 2 Corinthians 12. So if you can qualify by that, great, you're an apostle. But I can tell you now, I'm not a prophet, but neither are you an apostle. You cannot be an apostle these days. Just a sidetrack. Anyway. Peter was a true apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, this next word that I want us to look at is, Peter says, I'm an apostle of who? Of Jesus Christ. So if Peter says this, that's, he says, I am of Jesus Christ, I think it's important for us to know who Jesus is, right? It's an important statement here. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the only perfect one. He is the Son of the eternal God. He is the Word that was with God, and He is God. He is infinite in being perfect. He is the most wise and almighty. He is merciful. He is the only way to truth and to life. He is the judge of unrighteousness. He was before all things. Yet Jesus came to earth to serve a sinful people. Not because he needed to save himself, but he graciously served. He came to earth to serve so that we can be saved as sinners. He became sin even though he wasn't sinful, even though he was sinless for us. He is eternal life. And those in him has eternal life as well. He is alive. He keeps his promises unlike Peter. He is the one that unites us with the Father. The relationship that was broken by Adam, he restores that. Now this is what Peter reminds his readers of. He says that, I am of Jesus. 
brother, sister, can you say the same? Are you of Jesus? Reminding these people that he wouldn't be anyone if it wasn't for Jesus. Do we find our identity in Jesus? Or do we add stuff on? I'm of Jesus, but man, if I don't have fill in the blank, this occupation, this possession, then I am nobody. If I'm of Jesus, but if I don't have a relationship with this person, I am nothing. Or can we also clearly state, like Peter says, I am of Jesus, and that is enough. But he goes further. He uses this word exiles. So Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Peter is writing to those elect people of God in exile. Peter is basically writing to the real people of God. Those that were chosen by God. Now the word elect here before exiles is super important. It is important because it shows who the real people of God is. But it also shows us who Peter is writing to. Now these regions that I read about, those are scattered people all over the place, and Peter is writing to them, which means Peter is writing to foreigners, not necessarily Jews. But they are not exiles because they live in these areas. They are exiles because they were elected by Jesus or by God. They shouldn't be on earth. Their true residence is in heaven. That's why they are exiles. They are exiles because they were they are the elect of God. And we see this from, from the beginning of Scripture till the end. From Adam and Eve, as soon as they were excommunicated from the, from the Garden of Eden, everyone after that became exiles on earth. We see that in Genesis. We see that in Exodus. We see that recently in Daniel. Daniel being in exile to Babylon. We see it in the Roman Empire. And even today, all believers are exiles, not because they are not in their country of birth, but because they aren't in their country of their new birth. They are exiles because they belong to another kingdom, God's kingdom. And because of this, they will have tension and suffering. These two kingdoms can't coexist. Remember, we are born in sin, and sin brought in death, right? Brother, sister, suffering is not natural. Think about it. Sin, because of sin we are suffering. It is because of sin that we are getting sick. It is because of sin that we have broken relationships. God created the world to be good. And then sin entered into life. So while we are part of this kingdom, earthly kingdom, while we roam the earth as exiles, we would experience this tension, this suffering as exiles. God's election makes them exiles on earth, and so are we. Brother, sister, do we see ourselves as living as exiles on this earth? Do we see ourselves as, I'm not supposed to be here. I want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm saying this all in good reason. Because later on we'll see that this mindset, this is the actual mindset when we focus on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that we've experienced being saved by Him. That is the only thing that can help us to endure the suffering that we're going through. Nothing else. There's no booklet that you can buy 10 steps to come, become suffer-free. There's nothing like that. You can't tick a box and say, okay, I'm sorted. No. It's the only way that we endure suffering is to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the reason Peter is writing this letter. To make sure that these believers see themselves as exiles. God called them out of darkness to light. From death to life. And we still rub shoulders with death. We still rub shoulders with darkness. God called them out of that into his everlasting kingdom, reminding them that because they are not of this world, they will experience hard times. 
But because they are elect exiles, they should live accordingly. And because of that, their lives should look different from those of the world. Brother, sister, in, in all of human history, everybody suffers from the, the feeling of, I don't want to be rejected. We want to be accepted. We want to be chosen. I don't know about you, but when we lined up on break time at school, it was like, oh, please pick me for soccer, please. Or whatever you played. I played rugby. But then at the end, there's always one kid that stays there. It's like, oh. Right? We all want to be chosen. We want to belong. And we want to have, we want to have status. And this is what Peter reminds us of. He says, in this world, you won't have any of that. But he says, if your mind is set on Christ, which is my second sermon, I need to really be careful not to preach that with this one. But he says this, he says, you remind yourself that you're of Jesus Christ. I'm of Jesus. God chose me. I belong I was accepted in Christ Jesus, and I have status in Jesus Christ. Hearing about who Peter was, who Jesus is, and that we are exiles, where do you find yourself? Do you live in the world, hoarding things on earth, finding your identity in, in sinful relationships, activities, possessions? Are you chasing after worldly pleasures, lusting after your own flesh, being filled with bitterness and, 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 and jealousy? Or do you see yourself as an exile? You know, none of, this, none, of, none of that matters. Someone shared with me the other day, I shared with him that, man, all the prices are going up and we need to do this and all that and then how are we going to make the end of the month? And they just said, hey, it's only money. God provides. Do we see ourselves like that? It doesn't matter. The Lord provides. Our identity is in Christ. And this will help us through suffering. Throughout Peter, we will be challenged with these thoughts, specifically on identity, specifically on hope and holiness. So remember those three things as we work through this book. Identity, hope, and holiness. Because we are elect exiles in the world, we need to change the way we think of ourselves. And this brings us to our second reminder. Remember who saved you. In verse 2, look at verse 2. It says, um, according to the foreknowledge. So this word foreknowledge and elect exiles, those two goes together. It says, foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for the obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling with His blood. So in short, buckle in, we're talking about election. <clears throat> election is when God the Father choose a people for Jesus Christ, for His inheritance. God the Father choose, and He ordains saying, I chose you, and you will be saved. Then, as we have been taught, Jesus died. He paid the price for those people that God chose, right? And then the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and draw us to Jesus Christ. That is the order of salvation. But now you might ask, well, hang on a second, Tommy. It, 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 it says God the Father, then the Holy Spirit, then Jesus Christ. What's that all about? Here it is. In order of salvation, God chooses. He sent His Son to die for our sin because we can't save ourselves. And then we believe in the Holy Spirit that He left behind to draw us to Christ. Okay? That is what we were being taught. And it's true. But in our personal lives, I believe this is what's happening. God chose you before the foundation of the earth. You are chosen. Ephesians 3 talks about that. Now, the Holy Spirit works in your hearts and He draws you and He says, look at Christ. Right? He died for your sin. And then you believe in Jesus. And that's why Peter writes it in that order. God chose you. The Holy Spirit draws you and shows you Jesus. He reveals it to you. 
And that is what saves us. Because we can't save ourselves. We know in Romans 6.23 it says, The wages of sin is death. Brother, sister, before you were saved, you were dead. And if you are not in Christ Jesus, if you have not believed in it, you are still dead. And you cannot save yourself. Only the Holy Spirit can draw you, showing you Jesus, and be saved. And that should provoke us in worship of our King. Just a, a quick clarifying word here. Sanctification. Stuart taught on sanctification on being made holy. So it's a, a process. In the original Greek manuscript here, this word sanctification means something else. This sanctification means this whole drawing of the Holy Spirit. So nothing is wrong here. Don't be alarmed. It's just two sides of the same coin. So God chooses you. God the Father chooses you. Then the Holy Spirit, in this word, sanctify, draws you to show Jesus. And then after that process, sanctification that Stuart pointed out in the catechism, that's when it kicks in, in being made holy. So the Holy Spirit makes you holy in Christ Jesus, and then he actually continues making you holy. How wonderful is that? And we see Peter is writing in the order of salvation here. So God chooses. The Holy Spirit draws you and shows you Jesus. Now we normally talk about that in that order, but that is what it is. But now, this word foreknowledge we need to discuss as well. Because a lot of people say, no, God chose you because He saw you were going to be good. He, he saw you. He, he, he actually looked into the future and he saw that, um, yeah, Tommy's going to be a good person, which I'm not. So it can't be that. This word foreknowledge means that God saw you in his kingdom even before you were born. It wasn't because you were going to be good. God chose you regardless. He chose you to be one of his children. It means that both Christ and his people were the objects of God's loving concern. The Father foreknew who he will bestow his covenant and shower his affection on. That is what it means. God chose Stephen and said, Stephen, you are dead. I'm going to make you alive and you're going to love me and I'm going to love you. That's pretty much what it is. And again, that should provoke thankfulness. That should provoke worship in our own hearts towards Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with the people making a good choice or being good enough for Him to be chosen. No, we are dead. You can't choose without Jesus. So, the elect exiles are chosen by the Father, purchased by the blood of Jesus, and drawn by the Holy Spirit in a living relationship with God. You can go read about that in Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. When it comes to the doctrine of election, and that's why I kind of pulled my face, there are a lot of people that get ang gets angry about this whole thing. Uh, a person that says that, but, but it's unfair. How can God choose someone and not choose another? And humanly speaking, I can relate. It just does not make sense. My brother, my oldest brother is as unsaved as a rock. And it breaks my heart. I want him to be chosen. And I'll still pray for him every day. But if he's not elect, he's not going to be saved. So I, humanly speaking, that makes sense to me. But biblically and spiritually, we need to understand that this mystery of God choosing people for himself, that it's a mystery. God chose because He's God. He's the creator of heaven and earth. And brother and sister, we just said that we are dead in our trespasses. We are not good. So if God did not act in His grace in saying, I choose you, you and you, we would have all been dead. None of us would be saved. We are not good to be saved. We do not deserve to be saved. But let me encourage you. So instead of thinking of the unfair side of election, let me encourage you on the fair side and the undeserved side. 
Because God chose us and we were dead, we couldn't choose Him, what a wonderful privilege. If you sit here and your faith is in Jesus Christ, praise the Lord because He gave it to you and you can't lose it. It's yours to keep. God gave it to you as a free gift. And that should encourage our hearts. Family, if you are truly known by God, we are in God then, and we have a perfect advocate in Jesus Christ. We deserve to die eternally. But God graciously stepped in. He chose some of us to be saved for His glory. It's only by God's grace that the Father chose some people for His Son. It's only by grace because we are dead in our trespasses. We cannot choose God for ourselves. We can't do anything to save ourselves because we are dead. The only way to be saved is through the Father choosing us, through the Spirit drawing us to Jesus Christ. And I want us to let, just think about that. Just let it sink in about your commitment to Jesus, to God the Father, to the response of the Holy Spirit. That He reached out to you. He saved you. What is your reaction? Think about that. Not being in Christ, we are doomed. There's no joy, no comfort, no love. But with God, there is hope. There is an eternal relationship. There is love, there is joy, there is peace, there is comfort. But only in Christ Jesus. Now there's a, a little word here if we carry on. This word of, of obedience that, uh, that confuses a lot of people. The word obedience. So again, there, there are two sides to the same coin here. One side, the obedience of reacting to the Spirit revealing us to Jesus Christ. Obedience is, is in being saved and then after being saved. And this is, the, like I said, the reaction in the Spirit. It is the obedience to the one being saved towards the work that God is doing in their lives. It is to react to the call that the Holy Spirit gives you in your heart to shout out saying, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner. That's this obedience. To submit to the saving work of God in your life. Now even this obedience is a reaction to the work that the Holy Spirit does in your life. It's called irresistible grace. You just cannot help but shout out, Lord, thank you for your grace. Please save me. With the Spirit working in your soul and working, you cannot help but submit in obedience in professing Jesus as Lord and the only Savior. And we can only act in this obedience because of the sprinkling blood of Jesus, as our text says. Being set apart for service. It's like the priest in the Old Testament when God said, put those men aside for the worship. Sprinkling them with blood on the earlobes and on the feet, and that whole ritual, they are set apart. That is another word for holiness. Okay, so this obedient act of saving, uh, screaming out, save me a sinner, that means you were set apart by the sprinkling of Jesus' blood. Now this is the one side of conversion. The one side of calling out for Jesus to save you. Because we react in obedience to God's work. And we will have the other side of conversion now. The other side of the coin. And that brings us to our third reminder. Remember what He gave you. So we remember who we are. We remember... No, I forgot it. Remember who saved you. And then remember what He gave you. So we were chosen. We were called. We were saved. We were brought into the family of God through His work. And we need to understand that. That's the one side. And I want to ask you, do we understand this? Do we understand the fact that we did not bring anything to this relationship? 
except sin. Do we understand that we had nothing to do with our salvation? Do we understand that it's only by God's grace that He has drawn you to Himself? And just a, a side word here. Whether you were a drug abuser, a drunkard, or whether you were saved at six, this all applies to all of us. A lot of people in this congregation have, have come to me and told me, saying, Tommy, I didn't have a Damascus Road experience like you did. Well, praise the Lord for that. You don't have any baggage. I have baggage, but whether I have baggage of my past and whether you have no baggage because you were saved at six, this still applies. You were dead and Jesus saved you. And here's a list of everything that Jesus saved us from. He saved us from death, from being an enemy of God, being cursed and destroyed. He saved us from utter loneliness, from utter darkness, from brokenness, and a life without hope. Thank God. And He graciously saved us from this list. He saved us too, sorry. He gave us eternal life. He gave us hope. He gave us light. He made us alive. He gave us an inheritance. And more on that next week. He removed the curse of death. Brother, sister, if you're in Christ... You will live again perfectly. He gave us a family, and I'm thankful for all of you. He gave us security. You can make your hope in Him. You can put your hope in Jesus. And He gave us comfort. Family, if we truly appreciate what He gave us and what He saved us from, it will work out itself in this second side of the coin of obedience. Manifesting itself in this obedience. It is sub to submit your whole life to God when you become a believer. Your life should look different. Before I was saved, I would some mornings wake up in a dog kennel. And that might sound humorous, but it's not. It's embarrassing. God saved me from that. Now, I wake up next to my wife with a family. Loving me. Loving each other. Your life should look different. We became someone new. All this because of Jesus. There should be a change in your behavior. And Peter writes about this. With this concern on his mind. Concerned about how we live as exiles, in obedience. Because of your obedience, because Jesus Christ died for your sins and the Holy Spirit drew you to Jesus, that obedience should provoke another obedience. A life lived in holiness. We shouldn't look or smell or sound like the world. We should look different in our speech and our priorities, our conduct, our relationships, and our interests. So whatever the world goes after, you need to pull up the handbrake and say, let me just quickly have a look. Why are you guys going after this? Why are you spending so much time and money on that? What, what should I be doing? Just pause. But it does not mean to be hermits. Exiles are not those guys that are just aimlessly wandering around like zombies, bumping their heads as they go along. It does not mean to lock yourself in a closet because oh, I just shouldn't be in the world and I, I, I can't do this. No. These exiles know where they are going. Brother, sister, we are going to a new city one day. The Lord Jesus Christ is preparing mansions for us. And the banquet... That's the thing that I'm looking forward to. But it's there. And we need to look to that. We wander, not aimlessly, not just, oh, where are we going? No, we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. 
We look like him. What did he do? He walked the earth and preached the gospel. He helped people see who God is. We see that in Exodus. The nation of Israel did this whole tour of 40 years being disobedient. Fair enough. But what did they, what were they, the ultimate goal was to reflect who God was to the nations around them. We are exiles, and through our obedient lives, we should show people who Jesus is. Not that we're perfect, but that's a great conversation starter. I'm not perfect, but that's why I need Jesus. Brother, sister, because we are chosen, called, and saved, we are called to obedient lives of holiness. And listen carefully here. Remember, through Adam, we received the power to sin and obey. And because of God's holiness, we don't have the permission to sin. But God graciously saved some of us. Now we have the power and the freedom through the Spirit to fight our sins in obedience. And because of God's holiness, we have the permission to obey and grow in holiness. Brother, sister, that is obedience. Tapping into the power of the Spirit to obey God for His glory. And what does this look like? Just a quick list, and I've said this before in other sermons. But obeying God's commandments. Fight your sin and resist the world. Love and obey the Word of God. Love the faith community. Come to worship with the faith community. Make disciples. Not always wanting your own way. And give yourself to holiness. Family, if we truly understand what God gave us in saving us, we would understand that He has also given us obedience in Him. We should see obedience as a gift, not a burden. In our obedience, it's a, it's a way of glorifying God. By saying no to sin, we're praising God in that act. Being obedient in fighting our sin would be a blessing because we won't be tied down in sin. I don't know about you, but, but sin makes me physically tired. If I have a bad week, I physically feel tired. Let us fight our sin and be rejuvenated by fighting our sin. It gives you energy. When we are truly obedient, if we see the truth and the joy of obedience, we will see the grace and peace that He has given us. And Peter mentions this now. The grace and peace. First Peter, as I said earlier, is a book of hope. And Peter writes in the latter part in, in verse 2, he says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace. It's an undeserved favor from God, like we've said before in earlier in the sermon. We don't deserve grace, but God gave it to us graciously. When you understand that it's undeserved, but God gave it to you anyway, you will have peace. Now, I know most of you are thinking of this little animal on a stick saying, inner peace, inner peace, inner peace, inner peace. And he says that repeatedly because he can't find it. Do you know why he can't find it? Because he's looking in the wrong place. He wants to find inner peace within himself. Brother, sister, peace is not in yourself. You can only find peace in Jesus. And if you have received the grace from God, you will find the peace in God. And then it will multiply in you as you reflect on the gracious, undeserved favor that you have received from God. The more you focus on that, the more peace you'll get. And that is what Peter is saying. If you understand that God-given grace takes care of the worst thing in your life, which is sin and death, peace will be multiplied to you. And it's a mind thing, more on that in next week's sermon. But I struggle through that, just thinking, how am I going to go through this trial? How am I going to get through this? What, what can I do? Uh, Tommy, it's nothing that you can do. You cannot relieve yourself of the suffering. Only God can. 
But God, relieve me of the suffering, this trial. It's drowning me. Reflect on me. Focus on me. The writer of, of this book, Peter, remember when he stepped out of the boat in faith to walk on water, and he was walking, fo- focusing on Jesus, and then all of a sudden, he, whoa, these waves are big. They, they, they're they're going to swallow me. And what happened? He was swallowed. <laughs> Sank like lead. And what did Jesus do? Let him drown. No. He reached out. He said, oh, oh, Peter, Peter, Peter. Whoa, whoa. Bro, you need to focus on me. And then, there they go. They walked on water back to the boat. Brother, sister, to endure your trials, we need to refocus on the gracious Lord Jesus Christ, what He has given to us through His Son. And that is when peace will be multiplied, by focusing on Him. Now, Peter is the ideal prophet, uh, apostle to give us hope in a hopeless situation. Again, he's the one that betrayed Jesus. Hopeless. I betrayed my Savior. I rejected him. What now? Jesus came back from, from death and he restored Peter. Unlike Judas, who received condemnation. The only way you can experience the multiplication of grace and the peace is when you're an exile for God. Are you Judas? Do you feel condemned and judged by the Holy Creator? Not experiencing this grace, and that's why you don't experience this wonderful peace multiplied to you? Are you without hope? I'm glad. I've got three words for you. Repent and believe in Jesus. That's four. But repent and believe. Speak to any of us after the service. If you don't have the peace multiplied to you, you might not experience grace. And we can help you with this because we have the answer. Jesus Christ. Believe on Him. But as I started earlier, I know that our church is suffering. Brother, sister, if you are one of those that have been bruised by suffering... You might have been in the boat with Peter that you forgot about the grace that the Lord Jesus Christ has given you. Not that you're unsaved, but you've been beaten. You've been bruised. We're also here to help you. Come and talk to us. We can show you the grace and we can help you that the peace would be multiplied to you. By walking with you. Helping you to focus on Jesus and Him alone, not your surroundings. Move your gaze to Jesus. So we've seen that God the Father chose a people for Himself. Jesus died for our sins. The Holy Spirit that is with us, brothers and sisters. Some people are too scared to say that because it's too charismatic. No. No. We have the Spirit within us. And He points us to the wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ, to experience this undeserved grace that God gave us. It's a free gift for all that believes. And through that, our peace will be multiplied. We need to focus on our obedience, and through that, it's not a checklist and a rap list. Oh, I need to be obedient. No, I want to be obedient because I want the multiplication of peace. Now, through this, through the, through the truth of being in Jesus gives us a new identity and hope. So whether you are wondering why you're on earth or whether you are, why you are hurting as much as you do because of this sinful world, know that you're, if, if you're in Jesus and your life shows it through your obedience and passion for Him, you will be freed from this life. Brother, sister, remember God won't only save you for eternity, but He will keep you until eternity. Family, let us rest in the end. Let us not rest in the middle right now. Keep on going. 
We are almost home. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father, we praise you for choosing us. Jesus, we praise you for coming to earth to serve and to die for our sin because we couldn't. We can't. And Holy Spirit, we are so joyful that you drew us to Jesus, that you opened up our eyes to see the truth of Jesus. We praise you for your grace. I pray, Lord, for those that are bruised, for those that are hurting. Lord, help us to focus on this undeserved grace and let that refocus our gaze on the multiplication of peace in you. Please do this. Lord, we pray for those that are not in your family, that have not experienced grace. We pray that you'd save them today and that they would experience this wonderful peace being multiplied to them as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.